Thank you, Emily, and um, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to the Aspen Center for Physics free physics talk in honor of Heinz Pagels. Um, to introduce today's speaker, perhaps I can begin by remarking that as humans, we make maps to situate ourselves in the world, know where we are and where we're going. Some maps are spatial, like Google Maps. Others are maps in time, like calendars or timelines. Mapping the night sky, the cosmos, is a time-honored tradition in astrophysics for the same reasons. It helps us situate ourselves within the entire cosmos. It helps us understand some important questions like, where did we come from? Where are we going? What is the universe made of? And how and why is the universe expanding? Today's speaker will tell us about an exciting frontier project to map the universe in four dimensions, in space and time, in order to investigate these questions. Our speaker, Arjun Day, is an astronomer at NOIR Lab, U.S. National Center for Ground-Based Optical and Infrared Astronomy, which is located in Tucson, Arizona. Born in India, Arjun was an undergraduate at Northwestern University, received his PhD in astronomy from UC Berkeley. He's held prestigious, postdoc postdoc prestigious fellowships, such as the Hubble Postdoctoral Fellowship, fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute and the Guggenheim Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Arjun. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Okay, let me see if I can move this up a little bit. Is that better? Yeah. Not better. Good. It's good. Good enough. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's always a privilege to be both in the city of Aspen and also to work here at the Center for Physics. Um, I've been coming here for many years, but I've never had the chance to actually share uh, the exciting work that, that sort of highlights our field in so many ways uh, with a very broad audience. So I, I'm really thankful for, uh, for that privilege. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of personal history and then do a little bit about a scientific discovery that happened over the last century that sort of exemplifies for me how science is actually done and sort of why it's exciting and why it's constantly changing. And I hope that'll help you understand the sort of unusual situation that we're in today, uh, where things are really turned around on their head in some ways. Uh, and our understanding requires sort of a new influx of people and data and so on to really figure out what's actually going on. And I'll describe uh, sort of our state of knowledge of the universe uh, as we, in, in very broad brush terms, and describe this project that Joan mentioned, uh, which is attempting to solve some of these strange puzzles and also create this amazing map of the sky. So, but let me start on Earth. Uh, we know that Earth is sort of spherical. But here it is sort of hammered down flat into a two-dimensional surface. It shows you the entire Earth. The left part here sort of is the same as the right end there. Uh, and there's a problem, of course, in always depicting three-dimensional structures uh, in a two-dimensional form. And in fact, there's a, there's a very interesting exhibition next door at the Herbert Beyer Center, uh, where you can, which discusses this issue in some detail. I'm putting this up here not just to tell you about the problems of de depicting three-dimensional structures two-dimensionally, but also to point out that I was born in India, which you see over there in the middle left, <laughs> and then emigrated uh, to the US to, do, to study astronomy. And that, that is actually on the other side of the planet from where uh, the US lies. The lines here are roughly separated by about one hour of time difference. And that you know, is about a 12 and a half hour time difference, which of course makes it complicated to talk to parents and family and so on. <clears throat> But even growing up in India in cities, uh, which are filled with light, 
uh, you could still see the night sky, uh, at least a long time ago when I was young. Uh, <laughs> and, and occasionally we would have blackouts. During the blackouts, you'd see the Milky Way in all its glory, you know, stretching from one horizon to the other, entering the ground like a pillar. Uh, and it always fascinated me uh, that you know you could you could see this cosmos and see it had the privilege of actually seeing it from our planet. Um, and when I was young, I was given a book called uh, Patrick Moore's Atlas of the Universe. And the thing that really captivated me in there were these pictures of nebulae and the sky and so on. And what's amazing about them is that they look like abstract art, right? They they have all these amazing structures. This picture here is of a region in our galactic plane. It looks like abstract pointillism, but it's actually real. And it's art on sort of this immense, colossal, uh, let's say, astronomical scale. <laughs> that really fascinated me because, I mean, the, the, you're not only seeing this in the sky, it's also timeless in a way. You're, you're seeing a little snapshot because light has a finite travel time. You're usually seeing things as they were like our sun, you know, several minutes ago or the nearest galaxies, two points more than 2 million <laughs> years ago, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Seeing these objects, these art objects, if you will, in historical context. <clears throat> and that always fascinated me. And so this led me to sort of building telescopes because I wanted to see them you know, in my own eyeballs rather than in a book, and then into a career in astronomy. But humans have been looking at the sky and telling stories about it literally since we were ever able to. And eventually, when we could put them down in books and so on, we used to do that. And from these, these maps that we would make, we would notice that some objects would move, others would not. Uh, and from the moving objects, which were the sun, the moon, the planets around us, we developed fairly complex stories about uh, the way the universe is structured. The picture on the left here is an armillary sphere, which represented Ptolemaic cosmogony. We had the Earth at the center. You can see it's very complicated. It has all kinds of you know, little gears and, and circles and spheres that move around. It wasn't until we realized that in a heliocentric model with the sun at the center, all the motions of the planets are much more easily explainable. You end up with a much more simple, elegant form uh, for how to explain the movements in the solar system. And this aspect of it, this idea of, of finding sort of the elegant underlying solutions has sort of driven physics from the earliest days. I mean, it's, astronomy, of course, is the oldest science, and yet we're finding we know very little. In addition to, to mapping the positions of objects, we also realized that light from these objects actually contained a lot of information. So here's a picture of Newton you know, splitting sunlight with a prism, and he noticed that there were colors inside, inside what looked like white light. And we've noticed that even if you look with the most modern instruments in great detail, here's a spectrum of the sun, and you read this from top right, you know, down like you would a book, it goes from red to blue in the bottom right. It has all kinds of little dark structures, and that's light that's absorbed out of the solar atmosphere, uh, out of the solar uh, radiance, and it's a fingerprint of all the elements that are in the, the sun's atmosphere. And so this was a very powerful tool for understanding what lay in the stars. Cecilia payne Goposchkin in about 1925 was able to interpret this and tell us that stars, including our sun, were mostly made of hydrogen. This was not something that was obvious. People thought that it was made of stuff that was, you know, like stuff that's on Earth. So this sort of was a founding moment of making uh, spectroscopy a really important tool for exploring the universe. Photography was the next revolution that came along, actually that predated Cecilia Payne uh, uh work. But in the 1850s or so, we started taking the first pictures of astronomical objects. And Henrietta Leavitt at Harvard College Observatory found that you could actually tell the distances to stars based on the way in which they vary. And this was a very foundational discovery in astronomy simply because it allowed us to measure distances to distant objects and tell that these spiral nebulae and so on actually lay outside of our own galaxy, that they were really at very large distances. And so combined with photography, when we, when we, sent, uh, when we recorded the light of these distant galaxies on photographic plates, we were able to measure how fast these galaxies were moving towards or away from us. And we found that the bulk of them, this was done by work by Vesto Slipher 
uh, very painstakingly, you know, each of these little photographic plates was exposed night after night after lining up the telescope uh, perfectly. Um, each of these spectra showed that most of the objects in the universe, most of these spiral nebulae, were actually flying away from us. And they were receding from us at very high velocities. And because of the measurements of Henrietta Leavitt, or essentially the, the work that she had pioneered, people were able to measure distances to these same galaxies. And they found that as you went to further and further galaxies, they were moving away faster and faster from us. And so Edwin Hubble, shown there on the left, uh, and uh, George Lemaitre realized that, well, they used their imagination to realize that this was not simply because we were in the universe and you know socially unacceptable and all the galaxies were, were zipping away faster and faster, but that space itself was expanding. And this was the discovery of the expanding universe. And that was a crazy idea. And it still is a crazy idea that all of space is somehow becoming more and more space being created, is being exp space is expanding uh, this whole fabric that we live on is expanding. And uh, you know, it's, it's doing so in a very proportional way. Of course, light takes a finite amount of time to travel from distant galaxies to us. And so any galaxy we see, like I mentioned before, we're seeing as it was at a certain time in the past. So for example, a galaxy that's 1 billion light years ago, uh, light, light years away, is seen today as it was a billion years ago. That's 2 billion light years away is seen as it was 2 billion years ago, and so on. And the one that's 2 billion years ago, uh, light years away is moving twice as fast away from us as the one that's moving that's only a billion light years away, and so on and so forth. The reason I think this is such an interesting way that science happens is because we live in what we perceive as a static universe. We look up at the sky, it's the same every night, and we don't understand that it's constantly changing in this way. And so this is sort of the as a continuous cycle of how science works. You know, there's some curiosity, human curiosity that drives a set of questions. We then go out and ex explore that phenomenon in some way, better and better instruments. We make better and better measurements. And then we see patterns emerging. And then from those patterns, you have to use some high degree of imagination to explain those patterns. And that's what we call understanding. So in this case, it was the expanding universe. It could be something else in the future. That understanding itself is somewhat transitory, right? It only lasts until we make a new measurement that bre that breaks that law or breaks that understanding, or if somebody else comes on, comes along and asks the next question, which leads us to go back to the first part, which is curiosity, and the cycle begins again. This is a very human endeavor, um, and understanding in some sense is continue. It's like a child that's constantly asking. Why? Right? And you can never stop asking why. And after a while, we, we should never stop asking why because it always results in a more interesting question and a more interesting project that we could do to understand our surroundings better. Of course, understanding is not always uh, the most relaxing He's thing. He's been depressed. All of a sudden, he can't do anything. Why are you depressed, Alvy? Tell Dr. Flicker. It's something he read. Something he read, huh? The universe is expanding. The universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything. And if it's expanding, someday it will break apart and that will be the end of everything. What is that your business? He stopped doing his homework. What's the point? What has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. It won't be expanding for billions of years yet, Albie. And we've got to try and enjoy ourselves while we're here, huh? Uh? <laughs> well, for most astronomers, enjoying ourselves is actually <laughs> trying to understand the baffling, expanding universe. But Alvi would be even more depressed nowadays because not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. So we, we discovered only in the 2000s, in 1998, essentially, that this, this expansion is not uniform. It's not slowing down because there's material in the universe. It's actually going faster and faster and has been for the last 8 billion years. Now, this is very worrisome <laughs> because a, as it is, we had a puzzle before we knew about the, this accelerating universe that confused us. And that was the fact that most galaxies, as we see them, these spiral nebulae, some of them are, rot you know, they're, they're essentially rotating around. And you can tell that there's more matter in, inside these galaxies than we can see with our telescopes. And we call that dark matter for lack of a better name. 
And we realized that this actually made up a significant fraction of the matter in the universe. In fact, we were, it was six times more dark matter than there was stuff that you're all made of. Right? So we didn't like that problem, but we were sort of getting used to living with it. Now we realize that not only do we have this stuff in it, there's this other problem of that we named dark energy very, uh, not very imaginatively, that's also uh, dominate, dominant in our universe. And in fact, it turns out that we know this quite precisely at this point. So in other words, I like to say that we've understood the level of our ignorance quite precisely. All of the stuff that you're made out of is essentially what we, what astronomers loosely call baryonic matter and would annoy all the physicists in this building. And that makes up about 4% of the present day energy density of the universe. And then there's a remaining amount, which is about 26%, which is this dark matter stuff, at least that sort of behaves like normal matter in the sense that it has gravity, and so we can see it effects. We, can, we can't see it, it's invisible to us. We don't know what it is, but at least it has behaviors that we sort of understand. And then there's this dark energy stuff, which has the opposite effect, right? It behaves like a negative gravity, it's like a pressure that's pushing everything apart even faster and faster. And in old maps, you know, we would write, you know, here there be dragons, right? Hicks and Draconis, but unfortunately now 96% of this map is filled with that. So just to reiterate, we have stuff that we know something about, like this caffeine molecule, very important for physics, uh, and, and it's made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> that makes up pretty much everything that we can see, you know, from martinis to Mahatma Gandhi. So essentially everything that we can touch, feel, hear, experience, interact with in some way is made up of stuff we have a very good understanding of. And there are people in this building that could tell you way more about the way in which this matter is constituted and its peculiar property. But all of that is 4% of the energy density of the universe. And so if I take dark matter and dark, and dark energy, that adds up to something like 95 to 96% of stuff that we don't know about. Okay, so astronomy is the oldest science. And it's rather disconcerting that after thousands of years, we're in this state where you know, our understanding lacks a lot. But it is still a science that's driven by discovery and exploration. There's one experiment that was done. We live inside it, creation of the universe. <laughs> and we can't go out and really do experiments on a tabletop the way physicists do. Uh, we have to actually just observe and see what's out there. And that's been a tried and true method of doing astronomy. And, and this is what we're going to try and do now. So we observe and learn what's out there. We try and measure it with the best equipment we can build and characterize it as precisely as we can. And then we try and create a physical model which explains what we see, which then hopefully can be used for predictions. So in other words, if we see some new phenomenon, we say, aha, it fits perfectly in this model. Or here, we should go, look, go out and look for this particular phenomenon because it should be there because of our model. And then every now and then, we stumble across amazing truths like the accelerating universe or the expanding universe before then, or dark matter. Um, but nevertheless, even though I've told you that our ignorance is known quite precisely, we actually do know a lot about the universe. So here's a picture. It's very confusing, and I don't expect you to read all the things on here, but it's essentially a timeline that starts at zero with the Big Bang, uh, denoted by that little point, and then shows the sort of entire history of the universe. And we live on the right end of that diagram at about 13.82 billion years, which is the clock today. The very early universe, it was a sudden phase of expansion that essentially smoothed everything out, but put in, left in place these tiny little perturbations. And those perturbations over time grew in a, in a period of time in the universe, which we can't directly observe, but we know it's there because at a, at a point in time, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe became transparent like, and photons were able to travel from there to us. So we can see essentially much of this diagram all the way from, you know, from our vantage point on this right end, we can look back through time until we hit this wall to which none of our equipment can really see anything beyond that because essentially like looking at any of the walls of the room that we are around, there are no windows to look through really. That, at that wall, we have a spectacular image of the universe, the entire sky, and we notice that it's incredibly smooth. Um, all that's left are tiny little ripples that are one part in 10,000 or so. 
it's like having a, a you know a, a meter high block of completely <laughs> smooth marble and putting a human hair on it right that's that's the level of variation that you see on 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 the surface but that variation is essentially where we come from right? so those little red spots are places where the universe is a little hotter and the blue spots are places where the universe is a little cooler and the reason why the universe is hotter in the red spots is because there's more matter trying to jam itself in there. It's a little more dense. And that density draws in more material and more material, and it eventually forms the first stars and the first galaxies. And those are the seeds from which all the galaxies we see today are born, including our own. So it's not that we're just stardust. You know, we're also, <laughs> our homes are all in this, you know, whisper of, of cosmic, uh, of pri this primordial whisper. Uh, of the Big Bang. So if I zoom into that picture, you'll notice that it's not even random. That's very peculiar, but it has a very well understood physical reason. <clears throat> because of sound waves in this material that have been oscillating back and forth right after this initial expansion. And you can see, you know, here's a, here's a little plot, just a little zone in that picture I showed you before. There, but I can draw circles, which I've drawn by hand, which are about one degree across. And, they, and you can see that the, the structure that's on that scale, and it's that structure that eventually becomes galaxies. Two more galaxies form at these, the rims of these bubbles, if you will, <clears throat> than in the middle. And so we expect that structure to be imprinted on the entire galaxy distribution. So, you know, of course, we can see all these galaxies, but if we look at the entire sky, you actually see similar patterns. So this is a map, like I showed you before, of the entire sky. The left edge wraps around to the right edge. And you can see green spots and yellow spots and dark spots. Green spots are where there are more galaxies, and the dark spots are where there are fewer galaxies. And what you see is this rippled mottled structure, which essentially reflects what you saw in the, in the microwave background in this primordial picture from 380,000 years after the Big Bang. But even over after 13.8 billion years of history, this stuff is still visible in the sky. And so we want to use that to map out the whole history of expansion of the universe. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, we have a structure, this bubble, these bubbles, of which we know the exact size. It's always nice to know the exact size of something because then you can measure all kinds of dimensions using trigonometry. For example, you know, if I, I know the size of the chair, I know that a chair is all the way back to the room and they might go out to infinity, let's say. If I knew the exact size of the chair, I could look at the angle that the chair subtends as I go back and back further and further. And so I can determine the distance to any particular chair but simply because I know the size. And that's sort of depicted here. On the top picture, I have a standard ruler. That ruler is not changing in size, but because it's further away, the angle that it depends decreases and I can measure the distance to the ruler. If space was different somehow, that information is encapsulated in my measurements of this ruler. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be a ruler, it could be the edges of these bubbles, for instance, which is, which is what we were trying to use. But I, it's sort of exemplified in some way by this uh, corridor in the Munich airport, the sky bridge that goes from one end of the airport to the other, and it's a beautiful structure, and you can see this grid-like pattern of struts vanishing off into the distance. And if I knew the distance of any one of these struts, I, I could pick any strut way back here, measure the angle, the angle is smaller than this angle, and I could calculate its distance. But let me turn that around. Let's say I know the distance, and I know the height of the strut, then I know everything. I can measure whether the space has changed in any way from that distant point. So let's say that somebody was constructing these, these struts beginning at time zero and nothing was happening in space, right? They kept constructing these struts. Well, this is what you would see. But on the other hand, the space was expanding as they were constructing these struts. Now you might see that because the strut, even though the strut size is the same, the, the angle is changing quite dramatically from something that would represent flat space. And so that's essentially the measurement that we're trying to do across the entire universe. So take that technique and we want to find out how the galaxies are distributed in space and measure the structure 
accurately enough this bubble-like structure back in time and reconstruct how the universe expanded with time. And so the first thing we have to do in order to do that is to figure out where all the galaxies are that we can actually measure because we can't see the dark matter, we can't see the dark energy. All we have to go on are these galaxies that are tiny points of light in the sky. So we started doing this using telescopes at Kitt Peak and in Chile, Cerro Tololo, and it's not a bad place, your office to be there. Uh, they're, they're wonderful places to go visit and, and work at. And we essentially used cameras to take pictures of the sky. So here's one of them. This is a, a camera that was used at the Blanco telescope. Uh, it's essentially a CCD camera. It's about that big. And it, each of these is a, is a CCD, just like you have in your, it's the previous generation of, of uh, uh, instant cameras. And each one of them takes a picture of the sky like the one shown on the right, it's about the size of your thumb held at arm's length, right? So you get a little picture of the sky and that little piece of your fingernail, uh, of your thumbnail, any time you, take a, you point the telescope and take a picture. So you do this across as much of the sky as you can. Here's that same plot of the entire sky. This little red dot, that's the, that's the size of that little camera on the sky. And so we construct by taking millions of pictures <laughs> nearly a quarter million pictures across the sky to reconstruct what the sky looks like. And that's that picture I showed you before showing the galaxy distribution that was essentially constructed by counting galaxies in each of those pictures that we took of the sky. <clears throat> so the amazing thing about doing it this way though with a big telescope is that not only do you get this overall view of the sky, any little tiny piece of the sky has the resolution to see all the structure that's in, much of the structure that's in it. So in fact, here's a tiny little piece that's, uh, you know, only a, a, only a few arc minutes across and one sixtieth of a degree across. And you see all the galaxies and each one of those galaxies has you know, nearly a hundred million stars, uh, some of them even larger than the Milky Way. You can see all of that at the same time as, as you can see the larger scale structures uh, that are this echo of the, of the Big Bang. And since we did this all on taxpayer money, thank you, uh, you, know, you. It's all available publicly, right? Anybody can go and look at these data. They can uh, analyze these data if they wish, but it's most fun just to actually view them on your computer screen and you can scroll around the sky and see the structures that are there. And it's really fun to do. Every time I look at it, I, I, I think I see something new. Um, but the reason we did that in the first place was in order to find where all the galaxies were so that we could then measure their distances and then create this four-dimensional map. So not only uh, two dimensions in space, an extra dimension in time, and then see how that changes as we look further and further back in time. So to do that, we returned to Kitt Peak and to the Mayall Telescope in particular. Uh, this sits at Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is in Arizona, and it sits on the lands of the Tohono O'odham. Uh, so it's on the Tohono O'odham Nation. They, we have the privilege of using their site uh, for doing astronomy. So Here's a, a closer picture of the four meter telescope. It was built 50 years ago. And it was built by the battleship because it was before they really had all the modern tools of figuring out you know, with computer programs exactly how perfectly you can engineer something. So they totally over-engineered it. And the telescope inside this dome and in this cutaway is a 350 ton behemoth. The instrument we wanted to build in order to uh, look at the sky and do this experiment was 10 tons. You know, just one part of it was 10 tons that had to sit on top of the telescope. And there aren't many modern telescopes that can even support that kind of structure. So having this over-engineered, beautiful, 50-year-old, gracefully aging telescope was perfect because we could go there and uh, re-engineer parts of it in order to, to carry this telescope. Here's an engineering drawing that we made early on. The telescope sits down here. The mirror of the telescope sits down here. It's four meters in diameter. Light comes in from the top, bounces off the mirror, and is focused up into this little cage and where we focus all the light onto tiny little optical fibers. Mm -hmm. They're about the size, the width of a human hair. And all those fibers run down in this purple cable into a room down here where we analyze the light and record the light from the galaxy. The galaxies, of course, you know, that light, those photons have been traveling for billions of years. So we don't want to lose any of them 
as in this entire process. We want it to be a very efficient process, assuming it didn't extinguish itself on some cloud. We want all that light to be collected into these boxes and measured precisely for the, for the distances to the galaxies. This was an, a large effort. It took uh, many years and many people. We had to take off the top end of the telescope, bring in a new top end. You can see the scale. You know, here's here's a a, a person. <clears throat> Put the new top end of the telescope in there. Build large lenses. These were the large. We had to build six of these, and the largest one was more than a meter in diameter. Two of them were more than a meter in diameter. Load them into sorry. Load them into these barrels uh, at, for for putting on the top of the telescope. And then we had to design these tiny little robots. So here's an example of one of them. It, each one of these robots carries an optical fiber, which I told you is the width of a human hair, roughly. Uh, and it has to position it extremely accurately on the light from one of these distant galaxies. Now, we couldn't just build one. We actually had to build you know, thousands of these. <clears throat> and these were done very quickly uh, by... by by, grad, by undergraduate students and techs at the University of Michigan and at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And it was quite a production line uh, to, to do this. So we had to build many more than we knew we were going to use simply because we wanted to make sure we had at least 5,000 of them that worked essentially perfectly. So once we had done that, we had to mount them into these pizza wedges. Each of these pizza wedges was made of aluminum. They have holes in them. And each of these robots was inserted with a 60 meter long optical fiber running behind each one of these. And these, uh, this is an early picture, but this is the, there we go. Um, so you can see how they sort of move and to, in order to position the fibers. And they had to build 10 of these pizza wedges so they filled an entire uh, circle. And that's essentially the focal plane. So when the light bounces off the telescope, it come, it focuses the light onto each one of these tiny little fibers. <clears throat> this is just a little close-up view of how they actually move. So this is moving each of them individually, but in reality, when we are point, when we're observing, we move all five thousand of these simultaneously in order to position them, position them very, very accurately to about five micron accuracy. And then we observe the sky. And we move the telescope to a new spot and we read to go through this entire process again. And this process in a single night produces distances for about 100,000 galaxies. So we, once we had constructed all of this, we had to test and mount it on the telescope. Uh, there was a lot of, there were a lot of people involved in this as well. Here's Parker Figrilius, who's doing the actual testing and Bob providing some moral support. Uh, it all had to be placed at the focus of the telescope. Uh, and then we built these new spectrographs, which we put into a thermally controlled room, which is precisely controlled to less than a tenth of a degree uh, in temperature. So that there's no expansion or contraction of the actual equipment, and it measures the light in its paint in the galaxy. And then, most importantly, we had to build a room where we were all comfortable working in through the night, uh, and that's shown here during one of the first nights of operation of the instrument, uh, a few more than two and a half years ago. And even more importantly, that multi-million dollar instrument required, you know, a, a few hundred dollar piece of equipment that it would actually work properly. And that was the espresso machine there. <clears throat> and of course, we had a up with a logo on it that it's all a show. So we started about two and a half years ago. Five-year mission, we took about half a year to commission the instrument. Its five-year mission was really, you know, to go where we had never gone before was to measure the expansion history of the universe incredibly precisely to sub percent accuracy as a function of time for the last 10 billion years or so. And also to see how this web, this, this pattern of bubbles in the sky changes with time over the last 10 billion years. To do that, we needed to observe about 30 million galaxies and about 10 million stars and cover about a third of the sky. And so in the last two years, we've been doing this every night. Uh, at, at Kitt Peak. It runs almost automatically, but we do have people there for the safety of the equipment and the telescope. This is a movie of a single night taken by Pete Marenfeld, who works at Moore Lab. And it's a moonlit night, which is why you can see the light coming in through the shutter. Um, the telescope you know, points at 
looks like the motion is almost continuous, but it's actually stopping, observing, then moving, stopping, observing, moving, stopping, observing, and so on. And it does this all night long <clears throat> until dawn, essentially. And you'll see here in a minute, uh, the, sun, the sky will start to get even brighter. The sun will come up and you have to close the dome and go to bed. <laughs> So the project has been remarkably successful. In fact, it's, the instrument is working even more efficiently than we originally planned. And we just a few weeks ago, uh, we had our first data release. So similarly to other projects, you know, we like to make our data available because although there's a core group of us interested in this project of mapping the universe, the data in astronomy are useful to an innumerable number of projects. And so there are a lot of people who and do projects completely related to the cosmology I talked about, about they can study the evolution of stars, they can study the structure of the Milky Way, uh, they can look at nearby galaxies, they can look at how black holes grow in galaxies, all with the same data because data are really good quality and they're all completely analyzed and reduced for, the, for uh, these other projects. This is a little picture of the 1% of data that we've received so far. Our, we are at the at the point of all of these pillars of light. Each one of these is a direction in the sky where we've measured all the positions of the galaxies in three dimensions. <clears throat> and so this is only 700,000 galaxies total. And like I said, it represents less than 1% of our total data collection. But you can imagine seeing this eventually, not just in these tiny little beams, but covered across you know, a third of the sky and with 40 million objects. And I think that's our final goal. Our project finishes in about 2026 in terms of observations. Um, and at that point, we'll not only have this very precise measurement about how the universe has changed over time, but also this incredible movie of the sky, right? I mean, this, this map that you will just be able to, I'm hoping, able to fly through and see the, the structures as they emerge from, uh, fr from these data. I mentioned already that the data will be useful for many other branches of astrophysics. And because 2026 is not that far from now, uh, we're already planning the next phase of this experiment and what we will do both with the instrument as it exists now, because it's working remarkably well, but also on how to even improve it further, get a better understanding of earlier epochs uh, of dark energy. And that map I showed you where very few, early few, you know, less than a second of time was a very rapid expansion of the universe. There are some imprints of that that remain in the galaxy distribution that can only be seen if we go to very distant galaxies. And so the idea is to figure out how we can actually do that with this instrument or with a slightly better version of it. And then another aspect, which is very, very interesting to me is that because we can measure so many stars, we can get an extremely precise map of our own Milky Way galaxy. So we see the, the plane of the Milky Way stretched across the sky, but almost every star we see in the sky is essentially from our Milky Way. And this instrument gives us the ability to measure the movements of the stars very precisely. So using that, we can reconstruct the entire history of the Milky Way and do that not only for our own galaxy, but also for our nearest neighbors like the Andromeda galaxy. Of course, none of this would have been possible without a lot of people. Uh, there are about a thousand people now associated with the science team working on different aspects of these data. Uh, most of the funding came from the Department of Energy's Office of Science, taxpayer dollars. And the telescope was built 50 years ago with National Science Foundation dollars. It was one of the first missions of the National Science Foundation to create this observatory. Uh, and we had lots of international partners around the world. Um, and of course, like I mentioned before, you know, we have this miraculous site that sits on top of a mountain uh, in the, in the Tohono O'odham uh, nation, and we're privileged to be able to use it. So I know it's early. I probably spoke too fast. Forgive me. Uh, but I'd like to stop here. Um, I, I did. I loved this painting, which I saw next door at the buyer, at the buyer center. So if you get a chance to see this exhibition, please do. This picture really spoke to me in many ways because it captured a lot of what astronomy is about. You know, there's a, there's a map of the unknown that we don't know very much about. There's it's topology that we don't really understand completely. We know it's fairly flat, but we would like to explore it. 
for example, is the expansion of the universe over here the same as it is over there, right? I mean, those are measurements that we have never made to the accuracy that this experiment will take us to. We're using the CCD cameras to understand the images of the sky, and each one of those pixels record the light from these distant objects, much in the way of that rectangular grid down there. And we're taking measure of the of the entire universe. Right? I sort of there are so many aspects of this picture which has really nothing to do with astronomy that it are intimately connected to the nature of our exploration. So thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Arjun, for your work in the talk. I have some questions for Arjun. And um, could you follow up to repeat the question? Sure. Go ahead, sir. It's not a technical question, but I just read in the New York Times today that our Earth is wobbling and the, the axis is actually moving in a different direction there or is moving in such. How do you ever get to this narrow thing and tie it into all of them? But how do you make the adjustments for, for moving around? Hey, that's a really good question. It's not just the, the Earth's wobble is slow enough that it's something that doesn't affect us directly. But what it does, things that do affect us are just the weight of the steel, for instance, inside these telescopes. And you know, you point them over here, they warp slightly, and you point them over there, and they warp slightly. But there's one great thing, which is that even though the stars are all moving and the galaxies are all moving, we know their positions quite precisely. And so we can use that reference frame to correct out all of these errors. So every time we point to a new part of the sky, there are cameras that take picture, a quick picture of the sky, see where all the stars are, and say, aha, yeah. we need to tweak everything just so in order to get these little fibers perfectly positioned on each point of light. And so we do that in real time as we're, as we're observing. And that works remarkably well. Uh, how do you, you have these 5,000 uh, fibers and each one is in a little bit of a circle? Mm -hmm. And how do you select the uh, point of light you want to uh, get? Is it the brightest? No, that's a really good question. And that's why we did this initial survey. Right. So, each of these pictures, any one of these pictures, for example, there are many galaxies in here. In fact, a lot of these things that look like faint dots are actually galaxies. They're resolved if you zoom into them. And in order to get a fair sample across the length of time that we want to measure the expansion history of the universe, we actually we don't want to observe everything because we don't have time to do that. There are you know, three billion sources in here, and you can only do five thousand at a time. And at most, we'll do you know fifty million over the next five years. Right? So we need to figure out based on the colors of these objects which ones are most likely to be far away from us at the right distances, we get a fair sampling. And so that was the entire purpose of doing this initial 2D map. So we could then select, you know, the colors don't tell us exactly where the, where the galaxy is, but they give us a rough idea with some contamination. So the galaxy that appears, you know, that color might, might be far away, or it could also be a red galaxy that's a lot closer. And so we develop these selection techniques based on past observations to optimize the sample we get. Then we have to make the real measurement to see what fraction of them really were at the distances we want. So that was a process that we did called where we validated the survey and kind of reassured ourselves that we could do that experiment. And then we launched on our big experiment. But yeah, it's a really good question. And so it was a lot of work. Other questions? For um, more precise view of the evolutionary history of our own galaxy, Milky Way, is that based on more accurate position and velocities that you're measuring, and then essentially you're going to step back in time? Yeah, so it's it's one of these amazing uh, niceties, I guess, about the way our galaxy was created, or most galaxies were created. Were created by the by immigrant events, immigration events. So essentially from the, these little tiny fluctuations you see far back in time, those form the seeds of small, small galaxies everywhere. But as the universe expands, you know, gravity is an active force. And so smaller pieces merge into larger pieces and so on and so forth. In our own galaxy, this history started probably at least 10 billion years ago. But depending on the orbits of the things that came in to become part of our galaxy, 
they, their orbits still hold that fossil record of how they fell in and where they came from. So we have two pieces of evidence. One is the, the, uh, the kinematic signature, so the, how, the galaxy, how these stars are continue to move through our galaxy, but also a chemical fingerprint because if all of these stars were born over here, you know, they were they all had, they were all from the Caucasus, right? And the ones that were over here were, were all from the Urals, and and they're they're distinct DNA genotypes, if you will, to tell you know those groups apart. If you can get the spectra of those objects, so the spectra tell us two things: it tells us the velocities of these objects, and uh, and, you know, and and the actual chemical comp composition of where they were born, and that remains over time. It only they galaxy these objects only slowly you know become uh, uh, mixed into the into the overall structure of the galaxy. So it's like cultures you know, still keeping some sense of their culture, even as they come in and, and merge into the parent object. And we can see that not only in our galaxy, but also in the Andromeda galaxy you know, with this instrument. So you just uh, to understand one part there. So I don't want to use the wrong metaphor, but in those early bubbles that we see in the cosmic background, there were different chemical compositions that were formed in each bubble as things precipitated out of the... Right, so not at the length of the bubble, but the, the bubbles are huge. Uh, you know, th they're 500 uh, million, uh, sorry, billion light years across, essentially. Uh, but, but, but within those bubbles, little galaxies form. And depending on exactly how those, each of those galaxies forms, there's sometimes a different uh, element structure that's written into them. So for example, the very small uh, galaxy that's forming with, let's say, a few hundred stars, the first stars that form could be quite hot. They blow up in a million years and they spread their processed elements that they've created inside them. They started with hydrogen and helium, but you know, they've created all of these elements up through iron in the periodic table. They distribute that in the gas within that galaxy. Then the next generation of stars from, forms from that. Now the exact way in which the stars blew up in that galaxy might be different from the stars that blew up in this galaxy. And so the, the signatures are then slightly different. So you essentially have a slightly different chemical signature than these others. So we try and use that to figure out, there's obviously some variation within a galaxy. Not everybody is exactly the same, right? But their variations are, are, those variations are smaller than the variations from galaxy to galaxy. So that's how we can tell. Is the rate of acceleration of the expansion increasing or decreasing? It's increasing as far as we can tell. <clears throat> so the question that we're trying to understand, we don't understand why this is the case. In fact, one thing I didn't mention is that we have an incredibly well well, very high level, we can predict the expansion history of the universe because all of it comes from an integration integration constant in the Einstein, uh, you know, general theory of relativity. Right. For some magical reason, that integration constant makes the universe flat. In other words, if I draw a triangle, it has 180 degrees if I add up all the angles here. Uh, a very high level of accuracy in the local universe. But we have this. We don't understand why it was that way, or what you know, what fundamental particle physics uh, reason there is to, to create a universe that has exactly those properties. We could be very lucky, uh, or there's some higher understanding that we completely lack. Thank you. Big Bang theory. Yeah. Uh, is there such a thing as ground zero? That what it is and then where it started, that's a measurement. Ah, those are all philosophical questions that I don't know if I can actually answer. I don't know the answer to. So sure don't. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the singularity is something we just understand by extrapolating everything back to zero, right? I mean, we see an expansion. We say, well, it must have started at some point in time, unless it was oscillatory or something. And that takes us back to, to a certain time. We have multiple measures of that time or constraints on it, not simply from the expansion rate, but also from the ages of stars and you know, the, the other aspects of the universe that we can measure. Um, there, 
we're inside this point, right? We're inside whatever piece of has started expanding in this way. So asking where the center was is not a meaningful question from that perspective. How that fits into some larger uh, physical theory uh, to describe what we're seeing right now, that's well beyond me. And I'm not sure anybody really understands that right now. So it's a question that we have to, we have to keep asking, uh, but I don't have, I certainly don't have an answer to it. Maybe the same answer as you just gave, but um, going back to your image of, of time and the wall at 380,000, um, is there anything that in, in your recent science that is, could, could tell us that we are on, for instance, a path where this event, this expansion eventually slows, reverses, oh, so and takes us back to yet, you know, the seven? Right. So we used to think that, yeah. right. uh, we, we used to think that, in fact, the reason why we looked for the experiment that resulted in finding that the universe was accelerating, is actually an experiment to look for the deceleration of the universe. And so we did these very precise measurements of, of supernovae because there was a certain type of star that blows up that looks like, uh, that has roughly the same brightness if you can calibrate it properly. And we did that experiment to measure how the universe was expanding and to find that it was slowing down because there's stuff in it, right? We're in it and everything else is gravitating. And we found exactly the opposite. So if you'd asked me this question you know, 30 years ago, I would have said, yeah, sure, you know, maybe we'll find that it's actually at some point at which it will accelerate. But instead, we found that no, the expansion is accelerating and shows no sign of slowing down. So I would say the answer to that is no. Uh, this research is based on so-called old observatories, though to some of us, 50 years isn't all that old. <laughs> but um, would the fidelity of your research be increased by the use of the new observatories that are in orbit? Uh, no, in fact, the new orbit, new observatories in orbit cannot do this experiment. And the reason is that in order to, we're in one experiment, right? This big universe. And in order to really see the expansion, you have to map the whole sky or as much of it as you possibly can. The current experiments we put in space, we put in space because we don't want the blurring of the atmosphere to interfere with our view of the distant cosmos or nearby cosmos for that matter. And so as a result, we build these instruments, the very small field of view, because we can put lots of pixels in them to image them and get really, really good detail, right? So that's exactly the opposite of what we need to do for an experiment like this. And that's the, that's the problem. Um, it is an old telescope, but the, you know, these pieces of glass are, are perfectly made and there's no reason why they ever go bad unless someone takes a hammer to them. And, and so it's really a question of how we use these. They're actually very cost effective to use in many, many ways. Our total operating budget for, uh, for this telescope is about $9 million. Uh, for the new telescope we're building in the Southern hemisphere, uh, that, that will make a movie of the sky every night. It's called the Rubin Observatory. The operating cost is going to be closer to $80 million. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, it can't do the, this particular aspect of this experiment. So we could re-equip it to do that after its first mission is done. But I think that there's a, we all, it's a human characteristic, right? There's a shiny new thing. We want to do everything on it. We don't realize, in some ways, the potential of some of these older humans. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between galaxies cohering and solar systems around stars cohering and the expansion? In other words, there's a coherence as well as an expansion. Can you right. Uh, that's a really good question. So it's a, uh, you know, it's something that we, it, it's like Alfie said, when it's not expanding. Um, <laughs> gravity is a strong force. Uh, I mean, it's a very weak force from a, a fundamental physics perspective, but it's actually way stronger than the forces that are driving this expansion. Those are extremely weak and very long term. Now, it's possible that, you know, billions of years in the future, the, the even our galaxy will start to dissipate the result of these forces. 
but it's the same reason, for instance, you know, your whole body doesn't just collapse and fall to the ground. It's because the intermolecular forces between that are holding the cells together are stronger than the force of gravity. And so it's that aspect of the relative strength of these forces that we need to worry about. So expansion of the universe, we can totally see it and we can study it, but it's not something that affects our daily lives. Is it correct? Uh, I'm not a physicist, so I hope it's not too many unintelligent. But at the beginning of the Big Bang, gravity reversed actually with rep a repulsive action, and that's what caused the begin the expansion of the universe. Yeah, so that's the thing. <laughs> that, that is, like I told you before, our ignorance extends to 96% of most things. So it, it's totally not a, a, a silly question. In fact, a very fundamental question. There was some massive expansion here. And now, you know, from about uh, a few billion years on, there's another expansion going on. Are these two expansions related? Was it an early mode of dark energy? Was it something completely different? We have no idea. And I think it's a very good question. And trying to sort of decipher this aspect is why we want to push this experiment out into this regime where we might be able to get some sense of what's going on in this you know, first one over 10 to the 32nd of a cent of a second. How far back in time do you hope to roll the film, so to speak, with the work you're doing? Well, for, for this current project, I think, we, you know, we do pretty well out to about a billion years after the Big Bang, or you know, maybe a two billion years after the Big Bang. It's going to be hard to do much more than that. And even that part of the universe is pretty sparsely sampled. So we need another instrument or multiple telescopes to allow us to see that aspect. There's one last question. Okay. So your experiment you're looking at, you talked about with your bridge and how it works. You have the two pieces of information, the size and the distance. And so I can kind of get the distance from spectrographic data. Um, what, you know, what is your size measurement in your base graph? What ah. are you making? So, so the, in the early universe, these bubbles that are created, they all, they have a size of about a degree. The reason they have a size of about a degree is because from the point of the Big Bang, this 380,000 year window, there's this music that's happening in this plasma. Waves are bouncing around. And it's exactly at 380,000 degrees that those outgoing waves, those outgoing ripples reach that size scale. So we know that size scale from essentially something you can write down on a pencil and paper on an on, on back of an envelope to a high degree of precision. It's like, you know, if you had a pond of water and you popped a raindrop into it, it sends out this ripple. And you imagine if I did that with a thousand raindrops that all came down at the same time, I would have all these ripples going out. And I froze the pond instantaneously. I have a fixed maximum ripple size. And it's that ripple size that we see on this wall. I would like to um, thank Arjun for a really wonderful afternoon. And thank you all for attending. And I hope you'll come back for one of the future uh, physics lectures. So uh, join me in thanking Arjun. Thank you. <laughs>